O'Connell is an internationally recognized health and medical writer, consultant, and lecturer on addiction. He has created courses on addiction at Cape Cod Community College and writes the popular Cape Cod Times advice column on addiction. He is also the author of the booklet, Up in Smoke, and the book, Addicted, a guide to understanding addiction. Now, Tom O'Connell. Hi, welcome to Understanding Addiction. We're going to talk about addiction recovery today. Addiction, it's life-threatening. If it's untreated, people end up in hospitals, mental health clinics, jails, and in cemeteries. In addiction relapse, going back to the old behavior is very common because it's old familiar behavior. It's a little bit like a cookie cutter, a crooked one, that we keep stamping out the same old behaviors again because we're familiar with them. And yet there are other people who can come into recovery and not relapse and they can stay, they can quit and stay quit. It's a complicated subject. I want to emphasize that. Whether we're addicted to alcohol or work or drugs or food, it's all the same basic process. And we're, we're, the, word love, the word love is a key word, and the word love object is a key word. What we're doing is substituting something else for real love. And there's another notion that I want to get into too right away here is the CPF of addiction. And it's a key item about recovery. Addiction is chronic and progressive. It gets worse with time and it's potentially fatal. And recovery is a long-term journey, and it's not just something that happens overnight, and I want to emphasize that. It's, if the disease is progressive and it gets worse with time, then recovery also may be progressive, and we need to constantly work at it. I'd like to just do a quick review of the addiction process before we go in depth talking about recovery. And I've got a series of graphics that we're going to look at. First one is about the Latin word, in Latin, the word for addiction means devoted. It's, we, it's a love object, something we're devoted to, a habit that we really want to do and, and sometimes do even if we don't want to. And, all, and on the flip side of it, it's a prison sentence. It leads us into bondage. And the next, def, the next item about this I'd like to look at is what I call a useful definition. And this is addiction is a condition of unhealthy dependence that impairs our potential to perform to a impairs our ability to perform to our full potential. And that's what any disease does to us, addictive disease or any kind of disease. But my favorite definition of addiction, and there are many definitions, is Dr. Stanley Gitlow's definition. And this is a disease in which any technique for adapting to the problems of life is used other than interpersonal relating. In other words, addiction itself is a relationship. It's an unhealthy one. And it impairs all our other relationships. And it impairs our tendency to have a healthy recovery. And what we're talking about in recovery, let's talk about what, what we experienced in addiction. We had a process that we went through, and I call this the addiction process. We experimented, our feelings would change, we formed habits, we became dependent, and then we were addicted. And how did this affect us? This is what I call the PMESS of addiction. It affected us holistically. When we were addicted, we, every aspect was Addiction affects the whole person, not just part of the person. It's physical, it's mental, it's emotional, it's social, and it's spiritual. And so does the recovery has to involve, have to involve all of those elements. And we're involved with in addiction a cycle of a kind. And it's not exactly the same all the time, but in, in general, it's discomfort, the human condition, we're uncomfortable, we want some relief. We, want, we have a love object in our minds that we fantasize and it'll help change our moods. And then we find ourselves getting low or high or mellow and we, we want to escape reality. And then eventually we find some relief and then we, we go into a withdrawal syndrome when we're no longer involved in the behavior. And then we get back to the old discomfort again. Same thing happens in recovery. The person is no longer taking the alcohol and they end up having the same basic energy system that they're living with and they get they have discomfort and unease, disease, they have anxiety, sometimes depression, and all kinds of, of symptoms that make you want to go back to what you did before for relief. And it's only natural for a person to want to go back to the old behavior. And that's why recovery is such a challenge. And are there, what about ways to recover? Are there a lot of ways to recover? Well, I like to use the analogy, there are many roads to Boston, but they all get you there, every one of them. 
You can go to Boston in many different vehicles. You can go on buses and trains and cars or on bicycles or motorcycles or on foot, but you'll still end up in Boston. And I feel the same way about recovery. There isn't just one way to recover. Um, I tend to be in favor heavily of the 12-step approach to recovery because it's spiritually based. And there are other approaches to recovery that are spiritually based too. Well, we're talking about recovery from what? We're talking about recovery from addiction or dependence. A key word is dependence. And that's dependence with a capital D. We're in a state of suspense when we're addicted. We're in a state of tension and we're in pain. It's physical or mental pain. We're unhealthily, we're in unhealthy dependence. And that's what addiction's all about. And that continues to follow us into recovery, the same basic set of, of feelings and situations. And then on the road to recovery, there are some basic steps, I call them. And number one, <coughs> excuse me, admitting the problem, admitting it. And then we surrender to the reality of the situation. And then we realize we need help and we get help. We have to ask for help, seek help, and then work to change the behavior, which is a lifelong process. There are many kinds of treatment for alcoholism, drug addiction, uh, gambling, <clears throat> gambling addiction, all kinds of addictions. There are hospitals and clinics, there are therapeutic communities, there are specialists of all kinds, physicians, counselors, therapists, psychiatrists, hypnotists, acupuncturists, massage therapists, all kinds of alternative therapies that can help a person move away from addiction. And then there's inpatient and outpatient those possibilities in recovery, day treatment and evening treatment. And again, I'll take it back to the self-help movement. I believe that regardless of what other kinds of treatments we have, we still should be treated or treat ourselves to self-help 12-step recovery as an adjunct and not a replacement for other kinds of therapies. So ultimately, I think a combination of approaches is good in recovery. Many people have a therapist ongoing that they can go to for deep-seated problems or when they get stuck, but they have their recovery groups on a, on a weekly, daily uh, basis. Again, no number of meetings, no magic formula. Some people can do fine on one or two meetings a week in 12-step programs. Other people go once or twice a day or more. There's no formula. It, it's sort of like what our disease requires, that's what we take for our medicine. Uh, and speaking of disease, I'd like to, to show you the link between diabetes, for example, and addictive disease in recovery. <clears throat> they're both chronic, but they're treatable. In both diseases, the patient's responsible for his or her own recovery. So responsibility, self-responsibility, key item. Denial is possible with diabetes and minimizing the situation and, and not admitting to the reality of it. Uh, family support is helpful in both situations, addiction and diabetes. Uh, possible, possible genetic factors in both. And relapse is a, is a strong possibility in both diseases. And another key item, lifestyle adjustments are necessary in recovery from other diseases as well as addictive disease. And now we have some triangles to look at, and these are my illustrations of what addiction is all about. Base of the triangle, the self, S. A is addiction, and then S on the left triangle, it means self. I'm separated from myself when I'm addicted. In the middle triangle, the O is others. I'm separated from others when I'm addicted. And then the G is God. I'm separated from God when I'm addicted. In recovery, in the next illustration, in recovery, we remove the triangles by resolving our addictions and what happens is that we dissolve the triangle. Then we have a straight line relationship with self, with others, and a higher power. And that's the kind of relationship we're looking for in life. We want straight on, honest, truthful relationships. And then another triangle, what's addiction all about? I think what addiction's all about is trying to fill that empty space in that triangle that you see there. And we can't fill that emptiness. It's a bottomless pit. And so we keep trying, and that's what addiction is all about, an attempt to fill that inner emptiness, that discomfort that we all have as human beings, that the unknown that's inside of us and around us. And then addiction recovery, I like to think of also in a triangle way. What is addiction recovery? It's working at, on self to fulfill oneself, and that's a spiritual journey. And then we end up filling that triangle with a kind of spirituality instead of all these substances and other behaviors. 
But there's one hitch. You don't just suddenly recover. You don't recover overnight. You don't stop drinking and suddenly be a sober person and a balanced person. In fact, the founder, one of the co-founders of Alcoholics Anonymous said the major challenge in life for recovering alcoholics was to get some kind of emotional stability or emotional balance, and this would be a lifelong journey, and that's what it is. What's sobriety anyhow? In Latin, the word that, we, that th this came from means without being drunk. So in other words, it's a condition of not being intoxicated, not being drunk, not being under the influence of all kinds of addictions, whether they're gambling addictions, relationship addictions, uh, overeating, or you name it, all the different addictions. The, that same basic word, it has elements in it of, of being out of control when you look at the root meanings, and overcome. So we're overcome by our addictions. And then there's another key word in the field of addiction, temperate. You know, the word temperance, it means not extreme. This is what recovery is all about, learning not to be extreme. You know, not too much up, not too much down, somewhere in the middle, the ancient wisdom, the middle way. <clears throat> Another meaning is not distorted, not distorted. Addiction distorts us. It distorts our thinking. It, it distorts our feelings. Another definition, it's fascinating when you look at these words through a dictionary approach and you find the reality of what, what it's all about in sobriety, it's characterized by reason, sanity, and self-control. Addiction is unreasonable, insane, and out of control. So what we're, do we're doing in recovery is moving toward an opposite condition. And ultimately, sh we're showing mental and emotional balance. And I'm taking these words right out of the Webster's New World Dictionary. So that what's the goal of recovery? To show mental and emotional balance. And when we're doing that, we're not going to go back to the old behavior because we couldn't stand that anymore once we start to feel balanced. And so now let's take a look at some of the initials we talked about during addiction explanations. The five C's are a key item. And in recovery, they are too, because the energy will come back and we'll, we'll crave something in recovery to make us feel better. And then we'll have compulsions and we'll lose control sometimes and we'll continue these unhealthy behaviors in spite of the life-damaging consequences. One of these behaviors might be not attending enough self-help group meetings for our own health and our own balance. But we crave something else to fill that emptiness. And then when we find out that it's hurting us and it's damaging us, then we know we're addicted to something new and we have to work away from that addiction. And we have the same set of initials that we used in discussing the addictions. In recovery, we have to watch out for this one too. And this is the D, D, T, and W of addiction. We can defend our unhealthy behavior in recovery. We can deny that we, you know, let's say maybe need more attention to our recovery. We can develop a tolerance for various behaviors instead of healthy, be healthy recovery. And we can end up with, with withdrawal symptoms and feelings and kinds of depression, for example, that are common in recovery that move us into thinking there's no solution and then eventually go back to the old behavior for relief. Early recovery, I want to I want to stress, is a time of unbalance. We don't recover overnight. The first year of recovery is an extremely high risk year for all kinds of people in all kinds of addictions. There's a lot of risk for relapse during the first year. There are withdrawal problems. Mood swings will happen to people in recovery during the first year. Sleep disorders, because after many years of not paying attention to your sleep, you suddenly stop drinking, for example, and suddenly your body is, is all, all affected by this in the nervous system while it's healing, and sleep becomes a problem. And then depression or the opposite, agitation. These are very common problems in early recovery. And for some people, it takes years to get to the point of feeling they're having a good night's sleep, they're pacing themselves well, they're not so obsessive anymore. Not that that can't always creep in. And when I mention obsession, I talk about the OC of addiction. And these are very important ingredients. Obsession, the human tendency to be obsessed with thinking. And then compulsion means driven by feelings. And if a person had done this as an active addict, wouldn't it be only natural to be this way when you stop taking the alcohol or the substances or the other behavior? It's natural. It's natural, I believe, to, be, to have addictive tendencies. What's not natural or what's supernatural is the spiritual approach and being balanced and calm and, and working in the middle way and avoiding the extremes. And that requires effort. And it also is, it requires work on what I call the ISM of addiction. 
And the ISM means condition, but it also means being insecure, super sensitive, and moody. And that's what all people are who are recovering from addiction of any kind. They're very insecure, super sensitive, and moody. So it's only natural that they might swing into new addictions. And that's one of the things we have to be vigilant about in recovery. Another key item that, that I don't hear discussed enough is that in addiction, when we stop an addiction, we are immediately thrown into a grieving process. It's like a death. When I no longer have my piece of pie or my chocolate or my gambling at the track or, or in the lottery, when I no longer have my booze, when I no longer have all of these things I use to make me feel better, I'm in a state of loss and I have to go through grief. And so the grief process, as you might be well aware, includes a lot of factors. One of them is shock at the loss. And another one is denying the situation. Another one is called bargaining and saying, well, I can do this for a while, but then maybe I can go back to the old behavior. Another one is anger or that might erupt into rage. And this happens with a lot of people coming into recovery. And then depression and mood swings are very common in recovery. And this is all part of the grieving process, giving up the old behaviors. And then finally, though, there's, there's what we call acceptance. And it's like accepting someone's death. When I finally reach the point where I've accepted someone's death, then we've, I've gone through this healthy grieving process. And at the end of that particular tunnel is a thing called hope. And so we have to go through that with our various addictions. And so in recovery, if we're multiply addicted, as most people are, it's just we start with the most serious addiction, we pull away from that, and then the energy moves into lesser addictions and they become bigger. And we have to deal with them. And then when we start to deal with them, we feel new losses. And sometimes, in, often in recovery, we feel losses we've never felt before. So we have to go through grieving that was undone or unfinished. Grieving of childhood losses, grieving of losses in long-term marriages, grieving of all kinds of situations in life comes when the mind becomes clear, then what we haven't dealt with will now be dealt with. And so we have to be careful about the substitute addictions because it's a human tendency to want relief from our uncomfortable feelings. It all goes back to the uncomfortable feelings that we all share to some degree, although to different degrees because we're all individuals. Recovery, what it involves is self-education. And what that means? Self-care, self-responsibility, rest, diet, nutrition, good nutrition, exercise. And the slogan that's used in some recovery groups, you have to watch out for H-A-L-T, hungry, angry, lonely, and tired because that's when our addictions want to come in and control us, when we're hungry, angry, lonely, and tired. And so that halt is what that means. Halt, stop and think about what's happening and start to channel the energy in a more healthy way. Relapse, some of the fundamental reasons for relapse into old behaviors, lack of commitment to recovery, number one. Then complacency about recovery. And then testing the severity. In this 12-step programs, they call that going out to do more research. You know, go out and get drunk a few more times and find out what it really does to you before you commit yourself to recovery. And this is necessary for many people because they deny their addictions. And then inadequate support systems, not having enough people around us that love us and that can help us through the tight spots of recovery. And role models, needing good role models and not the wrong kind. And in recovery, we have wrong role models as well as, as right ones. And then insufficient vigilance about the, the uh, disease process. And what we have to watch out triggers for, for the relapse. We all have triggers, things that can set us up for going back to old, unhealthy behaviors that will end up, end up making us feel ashamed and, and then lead to more unhealthy behaviors. Some of the warning signs of uh, addic addiction relapse, stress that leads to distress. There's good stress and there's healthy stress, but the, when we get into distress, we're in trouble. Isolation, self-centeredness, obsession and compulsivity, mood swings and depression. And if you reach a certain stage where you feel, if you, you say to yourself, look, if recovery from my addiction feels this bad, I might as well go back to the addiction. And unfortunately, that's what relapse does to us. So when people start to think that way, they're usually isolated and they're not in the meetings where they could get the help that will keep them from going back to the old behavior. <clears throat> Another item is the mental valleys that, that, are, that people are subject to. If you've been through a lot of intensity through your addictions, then when you're in recovery, you'll feel mood swings that will be what I call mental valleys. 
It may not be deep depression, but you go, you're down, you feel down, and you don't quite know how to get up, and you feel exhausted. And a lot of these are after effects of many years of addiction. I, I think they come in the area of post-traumatic stress disorder, uh, chronic fatigue, and all kinds of things affect people in recovery, many people. Sometimes they feel stuck or frozen in a certain set of behaviors they'd like to change. For example, intimacy, not being able to do it, not being able to, to trust or talk or feel or get in touch with their feelings, uh, feeling apathy and having a feeling of limited options. All of these things are the kinds of feelings that can lead a person back into addiction. And then there are some other factors I like to always remember, and I, these, these factors, these few factors, uh, involve the concept of being allergic. That, that actually, that it's not just a substance, we can be allergic to a, prior, a behavior, and I want to emphasize that, that we're holistic beings. We can't separate the body from the mind. And there is a kind of mental allergy, which in Greek means altered energy, so that our addictions set us up and they make us allergic. Then we become very sensitive to do with that, and we have dispositions and tendencies that we have to watch out for. All of us do, to some degree. We have tendencies to want relief, we have tendencies to want to feel better, and that's human. And it's superhuman, in a, in, a, in a sense supernatural, to move away from those base tendencies, basic tendencies, and to go for something that's more hard to grasp, like spirituality, which is the ultimate answer. Uh, recovery. I, I don't want to ever say there's one way to do it, uh, it's an individual journey, but the group helps, and that's why I'm always pushing people to go into recovery groups, because our personalities are all different, but our problems have similarities. And so that's where we get the support that we need from other people. And in recovery, we, we have, we, we get, the self-help group helps us to some degree, or to a major degree, on an ongoing basis, and then we have, as I mentioned before, therapies available when we get stuck, and when we need certain help, and ultimately, out of recovery, and I can't tell you what these are going to be, you'll find new insights, you'll develop new habits, you'll have a new sense of values, regardless of what your old one was, and you'll have a new sense of freedom that you've never experienced before once you start coming out of your addictions. Uh, Bill Wilson, the co-founder of Alcoholics Anonymous, called Alcoholics Anonymous a spiritual kindergarten, and I love that phrase. I mean, what's the point of a recovery group? It's a place to go to learn about love, unconditional love. It's a way of life to learn about how to deal and relate with other people because addicts of all kinds, and I stress all kinds, regardless of what kind of addiction it is, lose touch with relationships and how to relate. And a recovery group helps people to go sort of to kindergarten and move into elementary school and high school and college and learn how to relate with other human beings in an attitude of unconditional love. So what they end up doing in recovery, ego deflation, key item, because the, the ego is what, what we're dealing with in our addictions. And we have to get humble to admit that we need help for our addictions and ask for that help and to go to recovery groups and share our deepest feelings. And you know, we don't, have, we don't have clear answers to exactly how recovery works. Like one time someone asked someone, how does Alcoholics Anonymous work? And the person just said to them, very nicely, thank you. In other words, it's a mystery how, we, how when we get together and the concept of two or more people getting together, there's something mystical that happens. And in recovery, if we can begin to come out of our isolation and share with others and listen to others and, and have empathy for others, we end up healing. This is really what it amounts to. And what we're doing is teaching each other in recovery how to be full human beings, full-fledged, loving human beings. And um, that leads me into the recovery realities. And what I think this journey is all about is learning to change old negative habits and behaviors into new kinds of positive, truthful, loving thoughts, words, actions, and reactions. And that's a lifetime process. That's not something you do overnight by stopping drinking or stopping drugging or stopping gambling. This is something we have to work on moment by moment throughout the rest of our lives. Self-help meetings, how many do you have to go to? Enough until you learn to like them and you don't have to worry about how many you have to go to. It's pretty simple. You just keep going until you like them and you make friends and then you end up, you wouldn't want to miss that meeting because it's a healthy place to go. Uh, recovery, I think of it as self-discovery. Recovery is self-discovery, and it heals us. And little by little, 
we wouldn't dream of going back to the old behavior, although as humans we can do it. I heard a story recently about someone who was 20 years sober and went back to drinking. He thought he was cured. And after a few days drinking, he realized that the disease was just as bad as ever, if not worse, and he's now in sobriety again. But this is the kind of, of human condition we have, and that's why one day at a time is the approach that's recommended. One day at a time. There's no such thing as someone is better than someone else if they're sober 10 years or 12 years and you're only sober for 10 or 8 or 9 or whatever. It's one day at a time we work on this thing we call life. And, we, and the underlying problems will emerge. So at, when we stop the behaviors that are setting a cloud across our minds that we can't have the awareness that we were born to have, then what happens is that as that cloud moves away and we start to see clearly and feel authentically, new problems emerge. And many of these are linked to what I call, what they call, the psychologists call post-traumatic stress disorder. In other words, after we have major stress, it affects us. There's a memory in the body and in the mind. And, and we often drink and drug and go into all our other behaviors to sidetrack those, those feelings that came with the trauma. In recovery, the trauma may emerge. And that's why sometimes it's necessary to have not only self-help groups, but therapy of all kinds to get us to deal with those traumas, like incest, uh, child abuse, uh, battering and violence that we might have been exposed to in our households. We need help with those problems in recovery. So what's the key to recovery? The key to recovery is the healing of the human spirit. And that's a major journey. And it all goes back to what I call the SAAH. We all share this in common. We have this, th these factors of in the human condition, SAAH, is a separation anxiety and attachment hunger. We all have this. We, d we don't like to be separated from those we love, and we have a, a, a desire to be attached to something that will make us feel better, and that's only natural. So in the addiction recovery process, I want to go quickly through some steps. First, you have to get safe, a safe place, then commitment to treatment, and learning how to recover, and learning why you're recovering. And then dealing with what happens after you stop. We've mentioned some of that. And then grieving the losses, renewing the personality, and then the psychotherapy that I mentioned and other treatment for underlying problems. Can we motivate people to, be, to go into recovery? Yes. The courts do it all the time. The workplace does it all the time. Husbands and wives do it all the time. They motivate each other to go into recovery. But until a person has what I call the moment of truth, they aren't truly in recovery. When you're doing it for someone else, it's not real recovery. When you have the moment of truth in which you are convinced that you need to do this for your own healing, then you're on an entirely new journey and need to make a commitment to that journey. And what's it, what's it, it's all about character development, changing what we call character defects that have come to us through family or, or through peer groups or through society, and we little by little have to change those things and learn how to take better care of ourselves Sexual issues, a whole other issue we're going to be getting into in another show and have done some of this in the past. We have to resolve a lot of problems. Humor, keep your sense of humor and develop your sense of humor. In recovery, a good sense of humor is a sign that a person is healing. So, and I've also, I also just got a sign that this show is ending. <laughs> and so we're going to do that. And I want to end with something I saw over in Ireland. It, it was a sign on a psychiatric hospital and it, it was in Latin. It said, it said, Festina Lenti, and it was written by Jonathan Swift, and it means hurry slowly. So in other words, in recovery, don't expect to do it overnight. Easy does it, but do it. And I wish you joy in your journey. Thank you.